ان الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله يا ايها الذين امنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن الا وانتم مسلمون يا ايها الناس اتقوا ربكم الذي خلقكم من نفس واحده وخلق منها زوجها وبث منهما رجالا كثيرا والنساء واتقوا الله الذي تساءلون به والارham ان الله كان عليكم رقيبا يا ايها الذين امنوا اتقوا الله وقولوا قولا سديدا يصلح لكم اعمالكم ويغفر لكم ذنوبكم ومن يطع الله ورسوله فقد فاز فوزا عظيما اما بعد فان اصدق الحديث كتاب الله واحسن الهدي هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر الامور محدثاتها وكل محدثه بدعه وكل بدعه ضلاله وكل ضلاله في النار وبعد then today باذن الله تعالى we wish to discuss the issue an issue that is something which affects the muslim communities in almost every part of the world where the variant muslim communities have gathered meaning that they come from variant backgrounds it's a trait which is found in many societies and many communities which is an evil trait and it is something that has exported itself even to the west even amongst those people who were born and raised in this country and that is the issue of forcing one's daughters into marriage and also the issue of racism as it relates to marriage and the issue of tribalism and qaumiyah and asabiyah as it relates to marriage so a person will not allow his daughter to marry except one from his own tribe or one from his own nation or one in his own skin color and other than that from the evil traits that are alien to islam sheikh ibn thaymin rahimahullah ta'ala from the major scholars of this era he was asked the question and he discusses the issue with regard to a daughter or a girl who is forced without her without her permission to be married to the one whom she does not wish to marry he mentions that the strongest opinion in this matter is that it is not permissible for the father or anyone else to force a girl to marry someone she does not wish to marry even if the father sees him to be suitable even if he may be suitable still not permissible to force her to marry the one whom she does not wish to marry this is because the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said la tunqahu al-bikr hatta tusta'dhana that the virgin must not be given in marriage up until her permission has been sought the hadith in bukhari and muslim so this is general that the that the virgin or the girl she is not to be given in marriage up until her permission is, is sought so no guardian and no wali is accepted or is given an exception from this principle in fact it has been reported in sahih muslim that the prophet of allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam said al bikru yasta'dhinuha abuha that the father must seek the virgin's permission so the virgin and the father have been specified i.e. that the father is not to be forced and the virgin if she refuses then her refusal is to be accepted so this is so this is in cases of disagreement meaning that in the case whereby some people say that she can be forced and others say that she can't be forced then that which is the principle or the underlying principle is that the prophet of allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam forbade the girl to be forced and she ordered and he ordered sallallahu alaihi wasallam the father that is not permissible for him to force his daughter based upon this it is not permissible to compel nor to force the girl to marry whom she does not wish to marry 
and the one who forces her to marry, then the marriage is forbidden. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has prohibited it. So he does not want the Muslim community to be involved in it. Because that which Allah has, been, has made forbidden, then he does not wish the society to enter into it, nor to practice it. So if we were to declare it to be valid, a forced marriage, then it means that we are involved in it. And that we are practicing that which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has forbidden. And giving it the status of being allowed, though the lawgiver, meaning Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, has made it forbidden. And this is something that cannot be, i.e. that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has forbidden this type of contract. So this type of contract is not allowed in Islam. So therefore the strongest opinion is that the father giving his daughter away in marriage to a man that she does not wish to marry is an unlawful marriage. And the contract is unlawful, the aqtu nikah, it is unlawful. So it must be taken to a judge or an Islamic court so that judgment can be made in the affair. As for the one who supplies false witness in this regard, meaning that the mother or the father or the brothers of the girl, that they bear witness, that they stand as witnesses to the marriage that is forced, that they stand up and say that though we know our girl or our sister is being forced into this marriage, we will still bear witness that the marriage took place. Sheikh Ibn Uthaymeen rahimahullah ta'ala mentions that this bearing witness is a, is a false bearing of witness. As the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Ala qawlu zoor, ala qawlu zoor, Allah wa shahadatu zoor. That the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, And I warn you against false speech. And I warn you against false speech. Rather, false testimony. So it is not permissible to bear, to bear witness to a marriage that is based upon falsehood. Where you know for a surety that your sister or your daughter or a close relative of yours is being forced into a marriage and you stand there and you bear witness that the marriage took place. Rather, this is a witnessing to that which is false and that which is forbidden. So those marriages that take place upon this basis, my brothers and my sisters, you will find in the long term those marriages don't succeed. And it is seldom that this type of marriage will succeed. So therefore you find as time goes on that the husband separates from his wife because she was never happy to marry him. Or he wasn't happy to marry her. But they were forced into the marriage due to tribalism. Due to the color of their skin. Or due to the nation that they belong to. Or due to the, due to the relationship that they have with the one whom they are marrying. So children that are brought up in this type of environment are children that are brought up quite often fatherless. Because the marriage fails, the father disappears. Because the sister was forced into marriage. As time goes on, the girl herself and the parents, them, or, or the, or the parents themselves regret the fact that they forced their daughter into such a marriage. But if only at the beginning they had adhered to the sunnah of Allah's Messenger وسلم, in that regard, then they would never have ended up in the situation that they have ended up in. So these types of marriages, ya ikhwan, we should not support them. Nor should we be witnesses for them. Rather, we should advise against them. And mention to those who are pushing forward these types of marriages, due to the fact that they are engrossed in racism, engrossed in the fact that they do not want their daughters to marry anyone except a Pakistani, or anyone except a Somali, or anyone except from their own tribe. These types of marriages, ya ikhwan, are marriages that destroy society and are marriages that do not bear, bear their fruits. Alongside this, alongside this, that, that mothers and brothers are forced into acknowledging the fact that they must toe the line when it comes to their parents in forcing the daughter into marriage. Then know for a surety that there is no obedience to the Creator in disobedience to Allah Jalla wa Ala. So Shaykh Ibn Uthaymin concludes by saying, that these types of false testimonies and the ones who falsely testify and bear witness to, witness to such marriages, that they should turn to Allah in repentance and retract their testimony. Likewise, the mother, since she signed on behalf of her daughter untruthfully, so she has sinned by way of that and she must turn in repentance to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and turn to Allah seeking Allah's forgiveness for bearing witness to falsehood and oppressing 
their own daughters and their own children. Walhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen wa sallallahu ala nabiyyina Muhammad. Alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salamu ala Rasulillah wa ba'd. Further to this, moving on to the issue of racism and nationalism and qawmiyah and tribalism, then this is something, ya ikhwan, that opposes some of the fundamentals of the deen as it relates to the affair of akhuwa and as it relates to the affair of being people of iman. As being people of Iman, then the people of Iman are not distinguished by the color of their skin, nor the shapes of their bodies, as in the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, in which he stated that indeed Allah does not look at your colors nor your forms, but rather Allah scans your hearts and scans your deeds. This is what is looked into when we seek marriage for our daughters or for our sisters, not whether he's from a certain country or from a certain tribe, or whether he's related, close or far. But rather what is looked upon is the iman of a person and his righteous actions, because these are the things upon which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will judge the people. So it is a sickness that we bar our daughters and we prevent our daughters marrying good Salafi brothers and marrying good people upon the sunnah with good religion solely because they're a different color to ourselves. Or solely because they don't belong to the same tribe, though they may even be from the same country, as is quite common amongst the Indian subcontinent and in some of the African nations. That a person may come from the same country, they may be from the same color of skin, but they will still refuse on the basis that they're not from the same caste or that they're not from the same tribe. And Allah Jalla wa Allah has stated in the Quran, Ya ayyuhan nas. إِنَّا خَلَقْنَاكُمْ مِنْ ذَكْرٍ وَأُنْثَىٰ وَجَأَلْنَاكُمْ شَعُوبًا وَقَبَائِلَ لِتَعَارَفُوا إِنَّا أَكْرَمَكُمْ إِنَّ اللَّهِ أَتْقَاكُمْ That Allah Jalla wa Allah has stated, O mankind, we have created you from a male and female and made you into nations and into tribes that you may get to know one another. Verily, the most honorable of you with Allah is the believer who has taqwa is the one who fears Allah, who does righteous deeds, who has piety. So we were created separate, meaning in our colors and our forms, distinguished. But those who are the closest to Allah and are the most honorable to Allah are the ones who have taqwa, have piety. Likewise, Allah Jalla wa Allah has stated, إِنَّمَا الْمُؤْمِنُونَ ikhwa, That indeed the believers, they are nothing but brothers. That the believers, they are brothers. Not that you come from a certain nation that you are brothers. Not that your skin color is the skin color of the one next to you. That's why he's your brother. The one who's your brother is your brother in Iman. The one who worships Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. The one who has established the sunnah upon himself. And he's implementing the sunnah and he has the correct aqidah. And he's following the way of the sahaba radiallahu anhu. Anhum. This is the one who is your brother in Iman. So you find some fathers and families that they are so stern in their racism and their qaba'iliyah, their tribalism. And they are so stern in the fact that they only want to marry the one who is of the same nation. That you find them that they would prefer the tariqus salah, the one who has abandoned the prayer. The one who is ghair multazim. The one who is not practicing his deen. The one who is not upon the sunnah. The one who is not upon the way of the sahaba radiallahu anhum. That they would prefer this one for his daughter. Just because he's the same color. Just because he's from the same land. Or just because he's from the same tribe. Over and above the one who may be from a different race. He may be from a different color. He may be from a different nation. Yet he's upon the sunnah. Worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. They would prefer the one who is a fasiq over the one who is salih. Just due to the fact that this one is from my tribe and that one he's black. That one he's a different color. That one he's lowly. 
just because they regard him to be lowly, just because he's of a different skin color to themselves. So they will prefer this. They will prefer this and what an evil state of affairs. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala orders the believers to be united. United upon the kitab and the sunnah. And here we have Muslims who scream out and talk about the injustices of the world and talk about politics day and night. But when it comes to giving their own daughter away, they would never give their daughter to the one who is other than their own skin color or from other than their own nation. Yet they would give their son or their daughter to the one who does not pray. Even though many of the scholars of the Muslims from the earliest times up until this time, from the likes of Imam Ahmad and Abdullah ibn Shaqiq and Ibn Hazm and Ibn Taymiyyah and Ibn Baz and Ibn Thaymeen and Shaykh Al-Fawzan and Shaykh Muqbil and many of the other scholars have stated that the one who abandons the prayer is an unbeliever. That's one opinion amongst the scholars. Even though there's a group of scholars who may be more in number who oppose that opinion. Nevertheless, the point is that the one who abandons the prayer there is a body of ulama who state that the one who abandons the prayer is an unbeliever. Yet a father would give his daughter to the one who has abandoned the prayer. Even though the Prophet ﷺ said, الْأَهَدُ الَّذِي بَيْنَنَا وَبَيْنَهُمْ الصَّلَاةِ That, the, that, the, that the, uh, the, the, the pact or the contract between us and them is the salah. Meaning between us the Muslims and those the mushrikeen and kuffar. That which is between them and us, the dividing factor is the salah. فَمَنْ تَرَكَهَا فَقَدْ كَفَرُ And the one who has abandoned it has disbelieved. The hadith in Tirmidhi and an nasai and the hadith is authentic. So what is, the, what is the Muslim community? Or what has the Muslim community come to when the situation reaches that level? That just on the basis of color or race or tribalism, that they would prevent their daughter from marrying the one who is righteous. But they are so afraid of what the Qabila will say. They are so afraid of what the tribe will say. They are so afraid that the people will say, my daughter married a black man. Or my daughter married a non-Pakistani. Or my daughter married a non-Somali. How are we as believers or Muslims going to face our Lord Yawm al Qiyamah? When our Lord has made the dividing factor the issue of Iman, yet we have made the dividing factor the issue of color and race and tribe. Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Allah, la fadla li arabiyin ala, ala ajamiyin, wala li ajamiyin ala arabiyin, wala li ahmara ala aswada, wala aswada ala ahmara. Illa bittaqwa. That he said, there is no superiority for an Arab over a non-Arab. Nor for a non-Arab over an Arab. Nor for a white person over a black person. Nor for a black person over a white person. Except in taqwa. Except as it relates to righteousness and piety and the fear of Allah Jalla wa ala. That is the dividing factor, the taqwa of the people. Not superiority. Because let's face it, we all come from that same lowly fluid. And when you examine that lowly fluid that emanates from the private parts of a man or the private parts of a woman, it doesn't have a color to it. Then you can decipher, oh, mashallah, this sperm is Somali. Or this sperm is Pakistani. Or that sperm is Jamaican. Or this sperm is from this nation. It's lowly fluid. And the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Annasu banu Adam. وَخَلَقَ اللَّهُ آدَمْ مِنَ التراب. That mankind is from Adam, the first of the prophets and the first of mankind. All of us, all of mankind come from Adam. And Adam came from where? He came from dust. That's where he came from. So how is it, or how can it be, that one race, out of its racism, not looking at taqwa, not looking at piety, not even looking at the ability of the person, whether he's able to look after your daughter or look after your sister, that you're going to base the whole marriage upon the fact that he comes from your tribe or comes from your nation. The Prophet ﷺ said, إِذَا خَتَبَ إِلَيْكُمْ مَنْ تَرْدَوْنَ دِينَهُ 
وخلقه فزوجه إلا تفعل تكون فتنة في الأرض وفساد عريد. That the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said, if one whose religion and character pleases you, and he proposes to you for your daughter's hand in marriage, then give him or give her to him. For if you do not do so, it will be a cause of trial of fitna in the land and great corruption. So if a righteous man comes to ask for your daughter's hand in marriage, do you first say to him, What's, you want to see what color his skin is before you decide? Or do you want to look at his piety and his righteousness and the goodness in his heart and the good character that he possesses, the truthfulness of his soul, the truthfulness of his speech and the ability that he will have of looking after your daughter? Or will you just look at his face and say, wrong color? Next one. Up until you find the one who agrees with your desires that he's the right color and he's a relative of yours. Is this the way? How are we going to look at the world around us and start talking about the oppression of this nation over that nation and talking about the oppression of this country, how we invaded another country and those kuffar, look what they're doing to the Muslims. Look what you're doing to the Muslims. Look at the oppression that you're doing to the Muslims. A person has iman, is a believer in Allah, worships Allah Jalla wa ala, follows the sunnah of Allah's messenger sallallahu alayhi wa and you oppress him due to the color of his skin? This is the justice of Islam? Or is this your oppression? The messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa himself, himself gave Zaynab bin Jash al asadiya in marriage to Zayd bin Haritha, his freed slave. So the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa gave this woman of Quraysh from nobility to who? to his own freed slave. Not looking at the fact that here's a woman who should not marry one who is lower than her or perceived to be lower than her. Likewise, he gave Fatima bin Qais al Qurayshiyya to Usama bin Zayd. And she was from Quraysh. And Usama bin Zayd, both of his parents were slaves, freed slaves. Because the thing that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wasallam used to look towards was the piety of the people. Likewise, Bilal bin Rabah, Al-Habashi, the Ethiopian slave who was freed by Abu Bakr al-Siddiq after the oppression of Quraysh upon him. That he, radiallahu anhu, married the sister of Abdul Rahman ibn Awf. This is how the Sahaba, radiallahu anhum, were. This is how they were looking at the taqwa of the people. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not enter you into Jannah and say the black people over there and the Pakistanis over there and the Somalis over there. As for the Pakistanis, then they're in first. And as for the blacks, they can go to the back of the queue. Is that the judgment? Is that the scales that are used on Yawm Al-Qiyamah? Or is it piety and righteousness and righteous actions? So you find that this was the way of the Sahaba. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has stated, وَالتَّيِّبَاتُ لِلتَّيِّبِينَ وَالتَّيِّبُونَ لِلتَّيِّبَاتِ good, uh, uh, good women for good men. And good men for good women is one of the meanings of this ayah. Meaning good for good. Good people for good people. This is what he's looked towards. And the Prophet ﷺ himself said that indeed a woman, she is married for four reasons. She is married for her beauty. She is married for her lineage. She is married for her wealth. Or she is married for her religion. Marry the one with the religion and you will be successful. Oh, kama qal Rasulullah ﷺ. Marry the one with the deen, the one who has religion, even though there are four matters that a person look toward, looks towards. But the most important of these matters, of these four matters, is a person's deen, is a person's religion, a person's piety, a person's adherence to the sunnah, not the color of their skin, not the color of their skin and whether they are related to you. And the Prophet ﷺ was the furthest of the people away from qawmiyyah and asabiyyah and racism. And the marriage between the different tribes and colors and races was common amongst the Sahaba radiallahu anhum and the early Salaf. Was common amongst them. The Prophet sallallahu gave two of his daughters, Ruqayya and Umm Kulthum, in marriage to Uthman. Two daughters to Uthman. And he married uh, Abu al-As bin Rabi to his daughter Zainab. And they were both, meaning Uthman and Abu al-As, 
were both from the tribe of Banu, Bani Abdi Shams. And yet the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa was from the tribe of Banu Hashim. Two different tribes. He gave three of his daughters away to two men who were from different tribes. Ali radiallahu anhu married his daughter Umm Kulthum to Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu. And Umar ibn al-Khattab was Adawi and he was not from Banu Hashim. So the, so the, the marriage from tribe to tribe and color to color like the marriage of Abdurrahman bin Auf's daughter to Bilal bin Rabah. From color to color, from tribe to tribe. Because the thing that they used to look at was taqwa. Is this man going to take my daughter to Jannah? Is he going to be a suburb, a doorway, a pathway for my daughter and my grandchildren to enter into paradise? This is what they were looking towards. Not whether the fact that is he going to bring the biggest Mercedes or whether he's got a law degree, or whether he's got the biggest amount of money. They used to look at the taqwa of the person primarily, first and foremost. And the Prophet ﷺ said, Ya ma'ashar al-shabaab, O gathering of youth, for those of you who are able, as some of the scholars say, for those of you who can afford it, then marry. This is what he ﷺ said. For those of you who are able, then marry. And he did not mention with regard to race or color or tribalism. Rather, he وسلم, said that the one who calls to this type of asabiyya, this type of qawmiyya, this nationalism, then he is not from us. And there are hadith which are even stronger than that, which we will not mention today <clears throat> and maybe leave them for another time. Yet we have Abu Lahab and Abu Talib, two uncles of the Prophet وسلم, paternal uncles. Both of them mushrikeen. And the Prophet ﷺ had no love for them. In terms of that he ﷺ did not pray janazah for them. Nor make dua for them. Though he was concerned for their guidance. But when he came to other than them. And they were mushrikeen. And they were enemies of Islam. Abu Lahab. And Allah Jalla wa re revealed an ayah regarding him and his wife. Yet he was the uncle of the Prophet ﷺ. So there were no ties of wala with those people, even though they were the closest relatives of the Prophet ﷺ. Compare that to the relationship that the Prophet ﷺ had with the likes of Salman al-Farsi and the likes of Su'ayb al-Rumi and the likes of Bilal bin Rabah. All of them from outside of the Arabian Peninsula and how he loved them and had concern for them. This is how the Messenger of Allah ﷺ was. So that Allah Jalla wa Allah has stated in the Quran, Wa ankihu al ayama minkum, wa salihina min ibadikum, wa imaikum, in yank in yakuna, in yankunu, fukara'a, yuhnihum allahu min fadlihi, wallahu wasi un alim. Where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has said, And marry those amongst you who are single and the righteous of your male and female servants. And if they are poor, then Allah will enrich them out of his bounty. And Allah is all sufficient for his creatures' needs and all knowing. So even if the one who is seeking your daughter's hand in marriage, even if he is poor, even if he is poor, he's not the wealthiest of people, but he's, a, but he's able to give her shelter. He's able to look after her with the ability that he has. He may not be the wealthiest of people, but he's a, he has a, he's a person of taqwa. He's from the salihun. Or from the Salihin, he's from the righteous people. Then marry your daughter to him. Marry your daughter to him. Otherwise, as the Prophet ﷺ said in the hadith that we mentioned, otherwise it will be a cause of fitna and facade being spread in the land. Tribulation and trials being spread in the land. And the worst thing is that you find that some of the people who have entered into Salafiyya, a minority, I believe, Wallahu A'lam, have brought some of this with them by way of baggage. And they have, as the Prophet ﷺ said to one of them, said to one of his own companions, that you still have some of the traits of jahiliyyah. It is a trait of jahiliyyah that a person has asabiyyah towards his own nation and towards his own people. And when you say to him, Ya Akhi, this is not the way. He says, I'm Salafi. We don't doubt you're Salafiyyah, but this trait that you have is a trait of jahiliyyah. Is a trait, a characteristic of the people of Jahiliyyah. 
So let us be ya ikhwan, ikhwa between ourselves. Let's be brothers between ourselves. Let us be people who love each other for the sake of Allah and give our daughters hands in marriage for the sake of Allah and for the sake of the deen. So it is deen that is important, not money. It is deen that is important, not the type of car that you have. It is deen that is important, not the color of your skin. It is the deen that is important, not the nationality that you come from, not the tribe that you belong to. Because all of that will wither away. But your deen will remain. And the actions that you have and the good deeds that you have, those are the things that you will carry back into your grave. And when your body is decomposed, and gone, then it is your deeds and your heart and what you had in your heart and your righteous actions that will carry you into Jannah. Not the color of your skin and not the tribe that you belong to. So make it easy, ya ikhwan, upon the people. Make it easy upon the people. Make it easy upon your daughters. Don't oppress them. And don't make it hard upon them. As Sheikh Abdul Aziz bin Baz has mentioned. Make it easy because when you've made it easy, then you'll be a suburb for khair in society, of spreading goodness in society. And you'll be a cause of, of, of bringing about righteousness in society. And, you'll, and likewise, you'll be the cause of getting rid of those evil actions such as zina. Such as the girls who go behind their father's backs. And they enter into courtship with men that they're not supposed to be. And the reason why they do that is because they know that their father will refuse this person. Because he's from a different color or from a different tribe. So it encourages them. And it pushes them towards sins. And some of the blame has to return back to the guardian. Who in, inculcates into, the, into his children that when you grow up, you will only marry from your relatives. Or when you grow up, you will only marry from your own color. And when you grow up, you will only marry from your tribe. So she grows up thinking that there's no way that she'll be able to go outside of her color or outside of her tribe or nation. So then she starts doing things behind her father's back. Is this what we want for our daughters? Is this what we want for our children? Is this what we want for our communities? So zina increases. Fornication increases. Courtship increases. Corruption in society increases. False pregnancies increase. Abortions increase. All types of facade is spread in the land. Due to this one thing. So it is no wonder that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala cuts it right at the very beginning. And the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa stamped it down right at the very beginning. We don't tolerate it and we don't allow it. The believers are brothers. Full stop, story finished. This is how we should be. Walhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Wa sallallahu ala nabiyyina Muhammad. Wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam.